Thank you. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, dear brother priest, brothers and sisters, great pleasure to be with you. Um, this is kind of a, uh, in my mind, and I think physically too, a kind of meeting of East and West. Uh, Bishop was telling me a little bit earlier how uh, they like to have things at this parish that, that are open uh, to the church for the spiritual well-being of the faithful. Uh, the Eastern Church, this uh, tremendous saints, uh, came from that venerable tradition. I think in our time, we have to learn more about this. We live in very, very troubled times. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Um, last Thursday, uh, I got up 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, preparing to go to the airport. I was going to fly to um, Kentucky, actually. I had a meeting with the United States Army. And I was preparing, uh, interestingly enough, uh, for a trip to Iraq. Uh, last year, I had a trip planned and a rash of kidnappings in uh, the place where I was going, which was uh, in northern Iraq, around Mosul, uh, that, that prevented me from going. They, they were afraid of the security, so they didn't let me go. So last week, uh, I had a, an appointment to go speak with the commanding officer of the 5th Special Forces and to replan the trip to Iraq, hopefully around Christmas. Thursday morning, of course, very early, I turned the television on, and that was when the terrorist plot in London was disrupted. And so I, I immediately, I've been through these things before, and I, in my mind, began to race ahead, and I, I knew exactly what I was in for at the airport. Well, not exactly. <laughs> I went early, and I never even made it to the counter. It seems that I resemble someone on a terrorist watch list. <laughs> you remember last week they were looking for the Egyptian students who disappeared, 17 of them? You remember where they were supposed to be going? Montana State University. You know where I live, Montana. <laughs> Apparently, one of them has no hair and is older. <laughs> anyway, two hours later, my flight had already gone, and uh, so we broadcast. I never made it to meet with the Army, and we, they sent a satellite truck to my home in Montana, and we broadcast live for the EWTN 25th anniversary. So we, that's how we did it, 5 a.m. with a satellite truck. The talk which I gave via the satellite uplink is some of what I'm going to talk about this week in an expanded version. Uh, that was one 55-minute uh, talk, uh, and, and out of that I'm going to draw four different talks this weekend. When the new millennium dawned, Many people in the world thought that there would be a, some kind of cataclysmic event. You remember all of the, um, the anxiousness? Uh, remember Y2K? <laughs> Y2K. We've for totally forgotten that term since then, happily. But um, we were worried about it. Well, New Year's came and went. No catastrophes. Uh, no no great upheavals, the world didn't end. Um, a year went by, and in the last six years, we have had an incredible amount of trauma in the world. It's heartbreaking what has happened. Just six years. We can start with the headlines 
of the New York Times, U.S. attacked, hijacked jets, destroyed Twin Towers, and hit Pentagon in Day of Terror. And those headlines lead off a veritable litany of things that have taken place in just six short years. December 13th, 2001, the terrorist attacks on the Indian Parliament building in New Delhi. March 2004, the Madrid train bombings. September 2004, the Vesian hostage crisis. July 2005, the London terrorist bombings. 2005, the civil unrest in France. You remember the, the pictures on television? They had the rioting in the streets of, of Paris. 2006, the crisis in East Timor. 11 July 2006, the Mumbai, India train bombings. Recently, the, the very sad events in Lebanon, in Israel. What about the toll in human suffering in just six years? The Second Congo War, approximately 1.8 million people died just in this century, five years. Since 1998, 3.8 million people died as the result of that war. The Darfur conflict, 400,000 deaths in Darfur, 400,000 people. Of course, the war in Iraq, almost 3,000 coalition deaths and estimates of between 50 and 100,000 on the other side. The Civil War in the Ivory Coast of Africa claimed 3,000 lives. Of course, September 11th itself, almost 3,000. March 11th, 2004, those attacks on the train system in Madrid killed 190 people and injured over 1,200 people. On and on. It goes. We could multiply these things. And what about natural disasters? An incredible array of natural disasters, one after the other. 50,000 or more people died in 2003 in the heat wave in Europe. France, Italy, other European countries mostly elderly people, that coincided with a critical shortage of nursing and medical staff in Europe. 50,000 people from a heat wave. The earthquake in Bayam, Iran, right after Christmas 2003, killed more than 26,000 people. An undersea earthquake then, the next year, the day after Christmas, in the Indian Ocean, approximately 310,000 deaths in Indonesia, Sri Lanka, India, Thailand, and other countries. The hurricanes of the 2004 season, Charlie, Francis, Ivan, and Jean, battered the Florida coast in the Caribbean, over 3,200 deaths. And then Hurricane Katrina in 2005, 1,800 deaths, over $75 billion in damage. On and on it goes. And of course, something you will not find on the internet lists of disasters. It's so easy to do research today, you know. You go on online and you do a search 
on Google or one of the search engines, and you have, you, you, you're buried in an avalanche of information. There's, it's so easy. When I was doing doctoral research from my doctoral uh, degree in theology, we didn't have all of that. I wish we did. Instead, we spent hour after hour in, in libraries, you know, covered with dust and, and, and peering into books. I read hundreds and hundreds of books. Now it's so easy. But one thing you will not find on all of these uh, lists of catastrophes and natural disasters, wars and civil un unrest, but I'm going to include it because this evening what I'm really going to talk about in this first presentation is reality. Uh, it's good to start at the beginning and a clear understanding of reality is where you always have to start, I think. So at the end of the list, last but not least, 250 million plus abortions in five years in the world. We wonder in our troubled times, sadly, we wonder why we don't have security. Job security. You know, it, my grandfather worked for the same company for 44 years when I was a boy. Uh, he never needed another job. He, he, he went to work for that company and he retired from that company. And that was the norm in those days. Now, there is not job security. You don't believe me, ask one of the people who worked for Enron for 40 years. Worldcom. I had a job offer from Arthur Anderson the year I graduated from college in 1973. I had job offers from all of the big eight CPA firms. Arthur Anderson was one of the biggest in those days. Of course, in recent years, uh, it was the biggest. I could have been a partner with Arthur Anderson and bankrupt. There's no job security. There will be no security out there until a baby has security in his own mother's womb. There will be no security out there. And there will be no peace out there until there's peace in here. One person at a time. John Paul, the great, wonderful pope of our recent times, made a very insightful, I would call it almost mystical statement. He said, all of the trouble out there, all of the divisions out there in the world, the divisions between countries, countries fighting with each other, religions fighting with each other, or inside of individual countries, like our own country, a terrible division, terrible strife, like never before, all that division between countries, within countries, even in the church. We've seen division, very deep divisions in recent years. Sad. Divisions in families. More than 50% of marriages end in divorce in this country. And that includes Catholic marriages as well. The Holy Father said all that division out there can be traced back to one single division. The division within individual human persons. And that division is called sin. That's where it all begins. And if we don't begin at the beginning, and if the healing doesn't take place within one person at a time, do not expect any healing out there. There is no magic silver bullet. Doesn't matter who the president is. Not going to matter who controls Congress. 
new social program, new military program. There will never be peace in our time. There will not. There will never be peace out there until there is peace in here. One person at a time reconciled to God. There's a war. There's a war going on. There's no question about that. There is a war going on. Oh, we see it flaring up. You know, it flares up in Afghanistan. It flares up in Iraq. It flares up in Lebanon. Uh, who knows where else it's going to flare up next. And all of the experts look at it. And uh, they, they give you their, uh, their judgments on it. Well, it's because of this. It's because of this. It's because of this. And they're all wrong. Every one of them is wrong. Oh, they make some interesting insights, but they will never get it right. St. Paul, during his captivity in Rome, reminded the people of something that the Holy Spirit said to the prophet Isaiah. He addressed the people of his day in these words, and, and I'll hand it on to you topic that we're addressing. The Holy Spirit said through Isaiah, and St. Paul repeated it, go to this people and say, you shall indeed hear, but never understand. And you shall indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should perceive with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn to me that I might heal them. They can listen and they'll never hear. They can look and they'll never see. Why? because they are not spiritual persons, period, exclamation point. That's why. The worldly mind cannot discern spiritual things. It takes a spiritual mind to discern spiritual things. Our Blessed Mother at Fatima said, and this is to the sophisticated educated mind of today it may sound like an oversimplification or even pious nonsense <clears throat> she said war is punishment for sin I once asked a very holy Carmelite nun a prioress she'd been professed for 60 years and I asked her one day I said I, this was about 10 years ago and I said, Mother, why is it that so frequently we don't seem to have strong, wise leadership? And she didn't hesitate even for an instant. Instantly, she replied, that's easy, Father. Punishment for sin. Look at the Old Testament. The chosen people lamented, we have no priest, prophet, or king to lead us. Why didn't they have any priest, prophet, or king? Infidelity. So this litany of things I read off to you, all, all these wars and the results of wars, all these natural disasters, all these calamities, <laughs> the more of them we have, it seems that the more forces like the ACLU and other godless and I might add at times brainless <laughs> entities clamor they clamor evict God the worse it gets it seems the more they want God out get God out of the school We've got to get God out of the schools. And then what happened? They got God out of the schools. Chaos. 
followed. Children killing each other. Their teachers. Their parents sometimes. And killing themselves at an unprecedented rate such that suicide is now the number one cause of death in the Western world among young people. Used to be automobile accidents. Now it's suicide. If you take the Western world, so-called Europe, Canada, the United States, suicide. They didn't want God in the schools. Evict God. Don't want God in public places. As if to say, in God we do not trust. One nation, they don't want under God. And so what happens if they win? If they succeed, they evict God, they expunge God from the consciousness of our country or of the world. God goes, his gifts then go with him. No God, no gifts of God, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Have you noticed, and it's hard not to notice it, that as the years have gone by, now we've had wonderful advances in technology, and I'm all for technology. Uh, I use it myself. Uh, I believe in it. You know, television. Um, long ago, I, I, I'm, this is one of my favorite things to do. I'm, I'm very thankful to God that he allows me to come and to be with good people like yourselves, to, to preach in person. But long ago, I learned that it was just as easy to preach to millions as it is to hundreds. Easier. Easier. I can preach to millions of people from my living room. I did it last Sunday morning. <laughs> Bring the satellite truck, park it in my driveway, and it goes out to over 130 countries, millions of people. Television, radio, the internet. We have the technology right now. If we wanted to do it, we could broadcast live. We've thought of doing this, we might eventually, from my chapel, in my home, every Sunday morning, my homily, all over the world. I don't have to go to the studios of ABC, CBS, NBC, or even EWTN. I can broadcast live right through my website. To anyone who has a high-speed inter internet connection. And, and millions and millions more are being added every year. Remember some of the wonderful stories in the annals of the saints? Uh, Saint Pio, Padre Pio, was always one of my favorite saints. And you remember the charism that Padre Pio had of bilocation? Remember you read in his biography how... Padre Pio could be in two places at once. He could be in the monastery and he could be off hearing someone's confession on the other side of the world. Last Sunday morning. <laughs> I was not only in two places at once. I was in millions of places. Hard to fathom. I think about that sometimes. You know, I mean, we, we, we don't, most of us, we don't have the, the kind of holiness that, that the saints have. Um, and we, we strive for this, of course. But uh, God has given us these other kinds of gifts that we should use. I'm sure if St. Paul were alive, he'd have a website. <laughs> I'd have, I have no doubt whatsoever that he'd have a website and be, be, be making deals with Mother Angelica. I got no doubt of it. Why? To broadcast the gospel. He wanted to reach souls. He would want to reach as many souls as he possibly could with the good news. We live in a strange time in history. Uh, as Dickens said in A Tale of Two Cities, um, they were the best of times. They were the worst of times. And I can say that about the times we live in. Oh, and uh, you know, 
you look at the news, especially in recent days, it's easy to say, they're the worst of times. They're also the best of times. And I would dare say they are the best of times precisely because they're the worst of times. Remember this. The darker the night sky becomes, the more brightly the stars of heaven shine. And you are those stars called to shine with the light of Christ. Very, very difficult times that we live in. I wake up in the middle of the night. I don't sleep very well. I, I was once talking with Mother Teresa years back, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And uh, there was another priest there, and uh, Mother didn't sleep well. And the priest knew that, and he said, Mother, how, how much sleep do you get? He said, ah, two, three hours. He said, two, three hours? How can you do that? How can you live like that? She said, I sleep fast. <laughs> Get it over with, you know? <laughs> but I don't sleep so good either. And very, very frequently, you know, I'll wake up in the middle of the night or toss and turn, and I think about these things. You know, I see this, the headlines, and I, I see the disturbing images on the television. And sometimes I begin to sweat. What kind of a world are we living in? I, I, I look at the pictures in Israel, in Lebanon, in Iraq. My brothers, my sisters, not one side or the other, both. You know, it, it's easy to become polarized. That's what happens in the world. You know, it's, a, it's like John Paul said, all that division. Let me tell you the key. There, there's an interesting, interesting thing, uh, principle in the spiritual life, I could call it. And I learned this from, from some of the Eastern uh, fathers of the church. Um, St. Peter Damien was a great anchorite for a while and, and, and a great mind in the history of the church, he said this. And there's tremendous insight to be gained from this. You know, sometimes in a short insight can be a hundred lifetimes of light. St. Peter Damien said, wherever one of us is, referring to a member of the church, wherever a baptized person is, wherever one of us is, there the entire church is made present through the inviolable mystery of unity. Tremendous wisdom in this. Wherever one of us is, for instance, the hermit in his cave out in the desert centuries ago, the Carmelite nun in her cloister, uh, my grandmother, 94 years old, dying in a nursing home. The whole church, the whole church, in all the prayer, in all the crucified love, bringing down grace on the world. Wherever one of us is, there the entire church and I'll go further, all of humanity through the church is made present. We can, using a word the church uses, we can sanate humanity, heal it, tear it down, build it up, heal it, hurt it. In our own life, whatever good I do, and I'm not talking about just directly because people come perhaps to hear me preach or I hear a confession 
That's a direct kind of action. That's good, certainly. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a human being, a baptized person, as a conduit of grace, in union with Christ. Whatever good I do affects all of humanity. Whatever evil I do also affects all of humanity. It's like we're united. We're, 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 we're one body, and whatever one of us do affects all the rest of us. You can sometimes feel very helpless, very, very helpless when you look at this troubled world. Um, I haven't felt called to go convert this country or that country because I learned a long time ago that I can't convert anybody. I can't. I learned that a long time ago. I cannot change anyone's heart. We need a lot of change of heart nowadays, right? Now look at these enmities over in, in, in that, that part of the world, that region, the holy land, that, that whole part of the world. Enmities that go back centuries, very, very deep. I could never talk someone out or in to something like that. Can't do it, but God can. I can't do it. I, I've never converted a single, single soul. People make that mistake. People will come up and say, oh, um, is, you must be very happy that you've converted so many people. I, not, even, not a one. None. I, I never converted anybody. Not one. I've never changed anybody's mind or heart, but God has. You know, sometimes he uses the most unlikely instruments. That's what we are, too. Uh, you have to understand that principle, uh, the principle of instrumentality. Something I learned a long time ago. This is an insight that I got in the Hermitage. Uh, the principle of instrumentality. You know, one, people come up. You know, they, they give you these hard questions, and they think they've got you. I, I have this happen quite a lot. Sometimes when I travel in the South, especially, some of my good Southern Baptist friends, you know. <laughs> you know they'll say, uh, one, one lady collared me one day in a, at, a, at an airport terminal and said, Brother, are you saved? <laughs> And I said, sister, when, I'll get, when I get there, I'll let you know. <laughs> I know what she meant, and I respected her. You know, we had a nice conversation. But do you have an answer for a lot of the questions that will be asked you by the people around you? Do you understand that you're important no matter who you are? eight or eighty, young or old? Do you understand that nobody's ever going to meet Christ, most likely, unless they meet him through you? One of us. One person at a time. That's how it's going to change. You can get feeling mighty helpless. And sometimes I do. I admit it. Every now and then I'll um, get kind of, oh, not depressed, but um, defeatist. You know, I start to, oh, how can I, how can I compete with MTV? <laughs> right? You know, mom, you know about that. Kids want to watch that. You know, what am I going to say? I, I, have, I could easily go to Rome and preach before the, Cardinal, the College of Cardinals if they invited me. I wouldn't be intimidated. I wouldn't be scared. But invite me to preach before a class of high school seniors. <laughs> and I'd be terrified. No confidence there, but you know, I found out something. All I have to do is show up for work. That's all I have to do. Just show up for work, and the Holy Spirit 
will do the rest. That's all you have to do. That's all any of us can do. You know, I, humility is the acknowledgement of truth. Now, tomorrow, I'm going to talk more about some of the topics I'm just racing over here, but humility is so important. That's where everything begins. But no, very few people know what it is. Very few people know. Humility is not going around saying, I'm no good, I'm no good. It may be that you're no good. But <laughs> no, you're good, you're good. <laughs> you're good. God created you, he doesn't create junk, you're good. But people think, you know, it's uh, hanging your head, oh, I'm no good. That, that can very likely be false humility. Humility is the acknowledgement of truth. Now that's St. Teresa of Jesus, St. Teresa of Avila. That was her de definition. Humility is the acknowledgement of truth. Little Flower said that too. Mother Teresa used to say the same thing. Now what does that mean though? Thomas Aquinas also, uh, in, in so many words, said that. What does it mean? I acknowledge who God is and who I am. God is everything. God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, all-merciful. God's everything. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first, and the last, and me? I'm a creature. He's the creator. I'm a creature. He's everything. I'm a speck. A speck of dust in the cosmos. God loves the speck. That's the truth. That's humility. And that's where you have to start. You know, we all have gifts. Every one of us. It would not be humility if I said, I just can't preach at all. I've just never been able to do that. I'll tell you what, every, every time, I've been doing this nonstop 15 years. I've flown 1.4 million miles in the last 10 years preaching. That's a lot of frequent flyer miles. <laughs> I can't remember a time that I wasn't scared to death before I did it. So anxious that I would be sick, including this evening. Including this evening. Argue with God. I can't do this. And then you do it. You show up for work. And the Holy Spirit does his job. You and I have our work cut out for us. The world is falling apart all around us. Uh, the, the, the hatred is incredible. I, I've never seen such hatred. And I've been alive 60 years now, almost. And I've never seen, a, in my lifetime at least, a, a time when there is so much bitterness, so much division, so much hatred. It gets worse by the day. What's the antidote? Well, you know this hatred, you, you know as well as I do where that goes, death. You see, we, we live in a world that has a death wish. We really do. You step back and analyze. You look at the world. Now, recently, that's not so hard to deduce. You can you see it all around you. But we have a death wish and have had for decades. From the moment of conception to the last moment of natural life and all points in between, we have this latent death wish, artificial contraception. Abortion, suicide, genocide, euthanasia, from beginning to end, death stalks humanity. And what's the antidote? It's so easy. You know, the most profound things are always the simplest. 
God, by definition, is pure simplicity, St. Thomas used to say. Great, perhaps one of the two greatest minds in the history of the church, St. Thomas Aquinas, he used to say, God is pure simplicity, but not to us. God in himself is pure simplicity, pure intelligibility, he's pure light, absolute intelligence, not to us. You know what part of the problem today is with the mess that we have? A big part of it is we've become afraid to speak clearly. Now tomorrow, one of my topics is going to be on leadership. Very, very, very important. Frequently, whether the leadership is in the family, uh, in the, the nation, sometimes even in parts of the church, we see it. We don't want to offend anything, and it's good that you have to be sensitive. You, you don't want to offend people, but you should speak clearly. Jesus said, say yes when you mean yes, and no when you mean no. All else is from the evil one. That's a quote right out of the gospel. Say yes when you mean yes, and no when you mean no. All else is from the evil one. The devil's favorite color is gray. It is. No black and white, no moral absolutes. Everything is gray. If, and, and maybe. One, one Baptist preacher, I know, he says, oh, every place I go, they make excuses for their sins. If this, and, 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 and that, and but that, and but that. And he said, it seems like we're going to hell on our butts. <laughs> He said it, I didn't. <laughs> to be clear, to be clear, to think clearly, to speak clearly, that'll go a long way towards solving a lot of the problems. But, you know, it, it seems like the politicians talk and talk and talk and talk, and the more they talk, the less they say, and the less they say, the less they do. And I'm not criticizing anyone. It's, it's like so common, so very common. And what about us? What do we have to do? What's our part in all of this? We've got to pray. And I know that that sounds ridiculously simple. God deals with every one of us, each according to the way he knows us. You know, God knows us by name. Uh, what that means is he knows us intimately. He knows us better than we know ourselves. Me, he knows me in a certain way. I was the little kid who, when I was six years old, the only prayer I can remember, I, grew, I went to Catholic schools when I was young and the only prayer, other than my normal formal prayers, Hail Mary, Our Father, only one um, prayer that I remember from my youth, and I was very young, six, seven years old at night, saying my prayers before I went to sleep, God, don't let me die like other men, <laughs> sick and in bed. I want to die with my boots on. I want to go out in battle. Watch what you ask for. <laughs> I was the kid who only played with the toy soldiers. You know, I, I was the kid who only liked hard contact sports, football, you know, boxing. How did he get it to be a priest? <laughs> My mother, after I was ordained, she was looking through some old pictures, and she was shaking her head. She said, God's ways are not our ways. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, Mama. <laughs> St. Augustine said, grace builds on nature. So God knows our nature. He knows everything about us. 
You know, I, I, I enlisted in the Army 1967 because there was a war. And I didn't know anything else to do because my grandfather had been in World War I in the Army and he was proud of it. He, he had them put on his tombstone. Louis de Fontaine, Sergeant, United States Army. He could have put a lot of things on his tombstone. But that's what he put on his tombstone, you know, and he was a, a good Catholic man. My father, World War II. You know, some of my uncles, Korea. My generation, Vietnam. Have you noticed that ev almost every generation, there's a war? World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, then, you know, uh, the Gulf War, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, on and on. And it never ends, and it will never end. There will never be peace until enough of us enter deeply into Christ and make him present in time and space until we become truly people of prayer. You know, learn about prayer. Uh, I, I've, when I taught my series on the Catechism, uh, that last sep uh, section, part four of the Catechism of the Catholic Church is on prayer. Uh, we, that was so popular, we, we broke it out as a separate uh, little series so people could get it uh, who didn't want to buy the entire series. By the way, this year is the 10th anniversary of that series on the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, when I did it, uh, here in California, by the way, uh, in Sacramento, the Bishop of Sacramento, Bishop Wiegand, uh, asked me to come and the way he said it was, um, uh, he said, come and teach my diocese the catechism. And uh, he was such a good man, and, and he wanted his, his children, really, to know the faith. We had nothing but opposition. Nothing but opposition. From beginning to end, uh, oh, I could tell you stories. I never thought we'd get through it alive. Uh, it, it was really something. And um, now this is the 10th anniversary. It's been on television nonstop ever since we did it. Uh, prime time, Sunday evening. Uh, it's a show. They play the episodes 1 through 50. When they finish 50, they start one the next week. It's gone to over 130 countries all over the world, millions and millions of people. I'll tell you a little story in conclusion. Just, and, and I'm just telling you this, my point in, in, in sharing this with you is m many of you know my background. Right? Many of you have, have um, seen my conversion story or listened to it. You know that I didn't come from the greatest background. Um, when I told my mother I was uh, coming to Southern California to preach this week, uh, her very uh, quick response was, oh, returning to the scene of the crime? <laughs> 25 years ago, I was in the streets of Los Angeles addicted to cocaine, homeless, lost, hadn't set foot in a church in 20 years. Now I'm here. And the whole point, the whole point of that, no, it, it, anyone, anyone, Mother Teresa used to say, God can write beautiful love letters with even the little broken stub of a pencil, referring to herself. You know, God can play a symphony on a broken violin, and often does. God can change the world through you.
Any one of us. Every one of you is called to greatness, and you have to believe that. And I know it's hard to, for us to believe that. I, I know I can't believe that about myself. I, I sometimes, it's, you wouldn't probably believe me if I told you because it's hard to understand, but this is like a dream for me. It's like it's not real sometimes, you know. I, it is real, I know it's real, I, but yesterday I was looking uh, through the... Uh, something the university I attended in Spain. And it's a, it's a somewhat prestigious university, University of Navarre in northern Spain. And there are a large number of bishops, archbishops, and cardinals who graduated from there. Uh, Saint Jose Maria Escriba was the founder of that university. And um, I was looking through it, and, and I came to the university section of notable alumni. And they had 25 notable alumni, and most of them are cardinals and archbishops, and there between two cardinals <laughs> was this miserable servant. <laughs> and I looked at that, and I, and I shook my head, and I just had to say, God must have a sense of humor. <laughs> but you see, God can take any one of us and do great things. Not because of us, because of him. And you look at the world today, all the chaos, and you might feel, tend to feel, you know, discouraged, losing hope. Don't. You are created in the image and likeness of God. Think about that. The image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, is Jesus, the Lord. Every one of us in his image. Every one of us with the capacity to do great things. And by the time I'm finished tomorrow, I'm going to tell you the shortcut on how to, oh, I won't make you wait, I'll tell you right now. <laughs> Go to his mother. Our lady will form it. Our mother will form it. Mother of life. You know why she's the mother of life? Because she's the mother of Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in this world which seems to have a death wish, with all the anger, the hatred, the wars, the violence, turn to your mother. Pray the rosary and do it every day. The tide of history has been changed multiple times through the prayer of the rosary, and no matter how bad it gets, fear not, little flock, for it has pleased your Father to grant you a kingdom. God bless you.